Ephesians chapter 1. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, how many of you pray that prayer in Ephesians often? In fact, you pray it uh, so much that you can pray it even without looking. Bless the Lord. Um, we shall read it uh, together right now, just a bit of it. I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, God, we pray it like this. We pray it like a prayer to the Lord. We pray it for our leaders, spiritual and political. We pray it for ourselves. And we pray it um, as if we're, it were, uh, we personalize it. So Ephesians 1.17, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened that we may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. When we did our eschatology school at Brother Larry's, uh, I was going to do another book of the Bible, and the Lord uh, just kept saying to me, the book of Ephesians and the glorious church. And it was so wonderful, because we got to take every verse Look at every verse, look at this marvelous book in the daytime. And then in the nighttime, we had Holy Ghost meetings, and it was really a lot of fun. And, um, but in this prayer, every, uh, this is the book of the glorious church. We're going to be the glorious church. When Jesus comes for our, us, we will be a glorious church full of the glory of God without a spot or a wrinkle. We will be in his image. We will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. He is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And he's changing us, the Holy Spirit, from glory to glory to glory to glory until we're just in the image of Jesus. Hallelujah. And so this book is all about the glory. And this prayer is about the glory. And uh, it prays for us to understand three things. And each one of those is something about the glory. Ephesians 1, uh, 7, 18. Let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened that we may know. Now, number one thing to know is what is the hope of his calling. And from many scriptures, you can see that we're called into glory. Number two, well, I'm skipping down to number three. What is the exceeding greatness of his power, resurrection power toward us who believe? But tonight, I want to emphasize the second one. What he wants us to understand, and this only can come, it's a prayer. This isn't something that only the eggheads in the church can understand. This is something that God gives you light on and revelation. And one of the things he wants you to, and I to have revelation on is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. God has an inheritance and it's in the saints. We have an inheritance. We inherited God. God has an inheritance. He inherited us. The Bible says that the Lord's portion is his people. You know, you go to a church if you are a minister that travels around. And the pastors maybe pick you up in the car. And they start to tell you about their church. It can go one of two ways. It can be, oh, my church is the best church you've ever seen. we got the greatest people. You're going to love preaching here. They're going to draw it out of you. We've been praying for two months. Glory, hallelujah. Or this is the hardest town. Nobody ever had a church here. I'm surprised I'm still here. You'll see we've got a bunch of lugheads. <laughs> And it's, it's how they see, to me, it's just such a precious 
um, privilege, blessing, and responsibility to stand before God's inheritance. In fact, he said, don't you all want to be teachers because they're going to be a greater judgment. Why? Because you were talking to his inheritance, something special, something his inheritance in the saints. Papa and Mama Goodwin, they are great old saints of God, gone on to be with the Lord. Now they pastored many, many years in Pasadena, Texas. And uh, she was just telling me once, after she'd finished her pastorate for many years, she said, I tell you, we always had the best people you ever saw. She said, we used to go to the, um, they were assemblies of God, and they, they had those meetings. I forgot what the assemblies called them, but they're special meetings they had. She said, and we'd be sitting up on the platform, and I'd just, I'd look out there at our people. And I'd just have to punch Daddy, and I'd say, Daddy, you notice how our people are just better looking than the other people? <laughs> she saw the glory of his inheritance in the saints, in them. I have a great respect for God's inheritance in the saints. And I have it because he gave it to me. This is a prayer that he'll give you something. And he gave it to me. And I'm going to tell you how it came, even though I've told you every single year for 10 years. You're going to hear it again. Because tonight, I don't want to preach. I just want us to find out why we're here. And I want him to reveal some things to us. And I'm telling you some things because I even, uh, yesterday and today, I've, I've, I've seen him connect some dots. And I just went, ooh. Ooh. And uh, we're going to start playing the old Secrets of Intercession meeting that we had in 1983. We're going to start playing it an hour, the DVD, uh, before each meeting. Because I've been listening to it and I saw dots connected. That's been 26 years ago, but that's no time at all to God. In God's time, a thousand years is as a day. An hour in God's time is 42-something years. So 20 years is just about half an hour. About half an hour ago, we had that meeting. And uh, we're going to start with Dr. Hicks. Did you start with him tonight, Dr. Roy Hicks? Well, we're going to start tomorrow then. I was listening to him. He was the head of the Foursquare Gospel east of the, west of the Rockies. Uh, Amy McPherson performed the wedding ceremony. You think you had a good ceremony, Cody and Aubrey. Amy McPherson performed theirs laid hands on them, but you, you had some pretty good ones yourself. And, uh, but anyway, uh, he said, this meeting is God. The people on this platform, you don't know how you got here. And it was a God meeting. Roof on fire, fire truck come, drunks uh, in the drunk tank. It was, it was some kind of a meeting. How many of you were in that meeting? Would you stand up? I'd like to know. 1983 Lynn and Mac were there. Katie, you were there. Mark was there. I see some others standing. Ah, oh, Miss Lana, were you there? Miss Lana was there. Liz Pruitt was there. I mean, Liz um, Sloan was there. You know Miss Lana from Gospel Bill? Yeah, she was there. Lee and Jan, were you there? Okay, the one in Los Angeles. We had four. And it was so supernatural. And, and Brother Hicks started it off, and he said, this is God. And he said, this, this is going to continue. This prayer is going to continue that you're starting right now. He said, I've been waiting on it. Nobody knows you. This is a Holy Ghost meeting. He said, it's not going to seem like it at the first because people aren't going to understand. But you stick with it, he said. You stay with it because this kind of prayer is what it's going to take to get us Jesus here, Jesus back, and the church ready for him. And I looked at Lynn, and I said, Lynn, we're still here. And God's calling people to pray. 
And the prayer is ever so much bigger and ever so much more unified and powerful. Did we have corporate prayer this morning or did we have corporate prayer? Lynn's going to be teaching again in the tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow afternoon, we are going to have some surprise. Bless the Lord. But, hallelujah. You know, you just think about this way you came. Brother um, Wiseman, when um, he received a word from the Lord about me, he said, you've had an unusual life. And it's been an unusual life, bless the Lord. And he doesn't know me at all. And it just sometimes I have to pinch myself. I'm telling you, you're going to hear about it happening just weekend before last. But uh, you're going to go back to one you've heard a lot. It was about early 80s. What year was it when I first met you, Phil? You just came out from the world. 82 or 83. God spoke to me about your gift today. Oh, Satan's so afraid of it. But anyway, we'll get to that later. Glory to God. If I'd be him, I'd, I'd be frightened too. Well, it was 82, 83, whatever. And it was July camp meeting, Kenneth E. Hagen camp meeting. And I went to the camp meeting every single session. I always kept myself very close to Brother Hagen because Jesus told me, I set you at the feet of the leading prophet in the land when you didn't know there was a prophet. I didn't, he said, you didn't even know there was such a thing as prophets. I didn't. And he just led me there to his feet at that meeting. And that was the only appearance I've ever had of when the Lord Jesus was in it himself and spoke to me. And, uh, but he led me there, and so I had the good sense to stay close to him all of his life, as close as I could get. And he used to come in my office and sit down. I thought about him when he, he'd talk to things to me about things in the Bible, and he'd say, I don't preach this, but so-and-so, so-and-so. Man, it was juicy. It was good. It was rich. And when the Lord told me to leave there, I didn't want to go. I, wasn't that I wanted to go preach. You can remember, Berta. I was just itching to go preach. But I uh, hated to leave him, you know, and those wonderful times we had together. Once he and Oral Roberts, he, he would escape in my office. There's where he brought John G. Lake's daughter and son-in-law, was in my office. And he, he brought um, Brother Oral Roberts there one day, and they, they wanted to talk about miracles and the greatest miracles they'd ever seen. And they sat there in those two yellow chairs in my office, you remember, Berta, and talked about the greatest miracles they'd ever seen. <gasps> I was so glad to hear. I was like a fly on the wall, soaking it up. And so the Lord told me, get on out in your ministry, get on out in your ministry, and I dilly-dallied around. And uh, I believe in supernatural things. I believe the church is supernatural. The book of Acts was supernatural. What's not natural is subnormal church services like we've endured. Called normal. They're not normal. Well, Shelly says, she's got a good explanation of normal. Normal, she says, is a setting on a washing machine. <laughs> Who in the world wants to be normal? With God, you're either sub or, you know... Super, super or sub. Bless the Lord. So anyway, um, I was pushing off um, going to leave, and I went to a meeting one night, and all the, the staff sat over in a certain section. And um, Hildreth Brissy, she was a prophetess. Her, her, um, and she said, I'm going to speak to you. She was a visitor. I don't ever remember her being in a Hagen meeting except one. And she was a visitor there with her husband. She went to the Assemblies of God Church, and she said, I'm going to speak to you in tongues, and you're going to understand in English. My first thought was, what if I don't? <laughs> and then she talked. It was very strange. It came out strange. When are you going to turn in your resignation and leave like I told you and go into your ministry? The Lord had told me, I want you to get out of, the, out of the boat and walk on the water with me. 
He said, some people have to get out of leaky old boats, but you're in a golden boat that's fur-lined, but I want you to get out of it and come out here with me. That's what the Lord told me. So I thought, oh, my goodness, she said that right in front of all these people that work here in this ministry, and I haven't even told Brother Hagen. And I said to the people around me, what did you think about what she said? They said, she spoke with tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're going to see a rise in the manifestation of tongues. You're going to see a rise in the manifestation of tongues and interpretation. On a level like the world and the church is not familiar with. Hallelujah. So I, I left Kenneth E. Hagin. I went in the ministry, but I stayed around him as much as I could. And that year I was at his camp meeting. And um, I went every session of the camp meeting. And then I had to get up and catch an early morning plane to go to Minneapolis. This was uh, before Mac and Lynn. I don't even know if Lynn had a prayer group. If she did, I didn't even probably know her. Uh, yes, I did know you, but you didn't, I don't know if you had your church then. I, I don't even know who's, it was a camp meeting I was invited to in Minneapolis. I cannot tell you who was the pastor. It was in a hotel. I went and stayed in the hotel room. I got there at 11 o'clock in the morning, and I said, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to take a nap, and then I'm going to wake up at 3 o'clock and get ready for the camp meeting tonight. So when I was asleep, I had a dream. And in my dream, there was a great house, and there was going to be a great wedding in the great house. And I knew it was the wedding supper of the Lamb. And there was lots of activity preparing for the wedding supper of the Lamb. I could sense the bridegroom's presence as well the bride. I watched it all with thinking about my, I guess, my, my witness ministry. I was the witness. And I sat in a great easy chair like this. And I had my leg up on the side like this. And I was so enjoying it. And there was a door over at the side. And it opened up and some people said, come help us get ready for the wedding. I said, oh no, you do your part. We've all got parts. God wants us to have parts. And that's your part. And this is my part. Ah, oh, it's wonderful. I thought that they were cooking back there. They came back the second time. Please help us come get ready for the wedding. No, no, you do your part. I'll do mine. This is mine. The third time they were crying. They were weeping. They came out the door. They said, please come help us get ready for the wedding. And then I was just translated back there. And they were not cooking as I had supposed they were unwrapping gifts. Oh, I think this is terrible, I said to them. These are the gifts of the bride, and you're not supposed to unwrap them. The bride is supposed to unwrap them. I gave them a little sermon. <laughs> then I thought, well, since I'm back here, I might as well see what they're getting. <laughs> and every gift was a big box like this with a big bow on the top, and these people were unwrapping the bow with a swish. The paper fell off, the box fell open, and inside was a garment. Now, when we get in this meeting to the ordination part, where God begins to speak us about being ordained to a new post, and he will before we leave here, don't forget the garments. They were garments. They were clothing. They were clothing for the bride. And they were earth tones, browns, greens, yellows. And these people took the garment, hang it on a hanger, and put it on a rack and hung it up there. Then I woke. And the Lord, the Holy Ghost, I still saw it. I still saw it. And the Holy Ghost interpreted it. And he said, those people were not who were unwrapping the gifts are the prayers. He said, they want you to help them unwrap the gifts. He said, the gifts are garment for the bride. And he said, these in these boxes here that you've seen, they adorned her for her earth walk. 
But look over there, he said, and there were some boxes that were just gossamer bows over gold and brilliant wrapping. And he said, there are the garments for her glory walk. She will walk in glory before she leaves the earth. And those gifts must be in, unwrapped. He said, gifts, the gifts for the bride are in people. He said, you have never seen the ministry gifts, apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher, nor what you call the nine gifts of the Spirit. You've never seen them operate like they're designed to operate. He said, you've seen them operate and adorn the church for her earth walk, but shortly before I come for her, you will see them operate for her walk in glory. You will see the pastoral gift operate like I designed it to operate. You will see the prophetic anointing for the congregation. You will see every one of these gifts operate and they are in people and the prayers have to unwrap them and you are to help the prayers. Hallelujah. So it came time to go downstairs. And I went downstairs at this camp meeting, and a trumpet player was playing. And I never heard any trumpet playing like that in my life. And the Lord said, there is one of those gifts. He said, the music that comes down for him originates in heaven. And it connects earth with heaven. And this is one of the glory gifts for her walk in glory. And so he played, and I listened, and then I stood up and prophesied, and he probably thought, who in the world is this? And I prophesied that the gift that was in him was from heaven, and that through it, God connected us with heaven in sounds the world knows nothing of, and they are light, and they are color. And they transform us. So I was telling that story in Cleveland, Tennessee, at Brother Norval Hayes Bible School. And his mother was there, Ruth Driscoll. Ruth was one of the most precious women you ever could know in your life. She was a prayer. She came to this meeting. She would drive from Cleveland, Tennessee and come to this meeting. She would just sit there and, you know, do her part in prayer. But one day Shelly and I were there. Shelly's a witness of this. I told the story because I saw that she was there and I told the story. And I was teaching the Bible school students about gifts. The gifts of God that are in us. And um, she became so almost agitated and she came up to Shelly and me and she said, I've got to take you out to lunch and no one else go with us. And we went out to lunch and she, at the restaurant, she got a room in the back all to ourselves where she told us the story. She and her husband were four square pastors in Tulsa. They had used all of their money to personally purchase a church. I believe it was an old Methodist church. She, they were living in the basement of the church. She was very pregnant with Phil. And the Lord told her to go up into the sanctuary. She went up into the sanctuary where they had stained glass windows. And there came sounds and light and glory through those colors, through that stained glass. And they would be the colors that came through. She said it was all the... Um, the glissandos, the, it was all the moves that Phil makes and up and down the scale with his trumpet, but it wasn't a trumpet. It was a heavenly instrument she did not recognize. And as she sat there, the sounds and the light went into her and into the child. Satan tried to lock up your gift. He's the one that did it. No one else. But he didn't get the job done. And your gift. Your gift. 
your gift will minister to Rasandele Mejelianda, the bride of Coramacalia, the church. But in this meeting, he's going to do some things he promised by the Spirit, even as you play. So come, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Say, Lord, I receive. I receive your gift in me. I am a part of your glorious inheritance. Whatever you want to release into me, touch to flow out of me. I open myself now to you. Thank you, Lord, for your gift in Phil Driscoll. Amen. Please. 
speak words that you hear in dreams. I speak words of comfort and cheer to me. He was a
us free, makes us free, makes us free, makes us free.
to be worshipped and adored to be honored to be lifted high and I turn Our voices, Lord, we give you thanks right now. We shout out and
just receive it now. As the sound touches you, it's a connector to your faith. Receive. Receive. You spilled your blood for me so that I Faithful and true, you, my Lord, you are wonderful to me. So I will lift my voice and sing. Praises to your might to me. I will lift my faith to you. You you.
Thank you right now for your presence. Thank you, Lord. It is an honor to stand in the presence of the King. Yes. It's an honor to stand in the presence of the King. So we stand before you, Lord, as your chosen generation, your royal priesthood, and your holy nation. We say that we are a peculiar people who will show forth your praises because you've called us out of darkness and called us into your light. So we purpose right now to stand in your light. In the name of Jesus. Billy, what the Lord spoke to me was that there is a gift on the inside of me that I don't totally understand, never probably could understand it because it's not something I ever worked to have. But part of the gift that's in me is to release into the earth the sounds of heaven. That's true. Part of what is my calling is to call pastors. Yes. To open up the eyes of your understanding because in the church right now are sounds of heaven, but they're not noticed, they're not announced, they're not appreciated, they're not given free reign, they're put in a little cubby hole, but God says this is the day to take off all of the blinders because the sounds of heaven must come to the earth. The sounds of heaven must be heard in the church 
It's not going to be just heard on television. It's not going to be heard in special meetings. It's going to be being known that any time I am in the house, says the Lord, it should be declared a special meeting. I'm not just looking for great crowds. I'm looking for a great move of my spirit. And I'm calling you to come up higher. I'm calling musicians to begin to stand in your places and be who I have called you to be. I am calling pastors to let go of the control over music and let it be free because I will be worshiped, says the Lord. I will be honored, says the Lord. I will be praised, says the Lord. And I will not be content with just songs that are heard and made popular by people you might respect. I'm going to give songs to the little ones. I'm going to give songs to the ones you've never heard that'll shake mountains. It'll shake It'll shake walls that have held cities abeyance. It'll take walls that have long been up that Satan has raised to stop the sounds of heaven from impregnating my people. Now listen, wait just a minute. Sounds are not an earthly force. Sounds are heavenly. Yes. Sounds are not an earthly phenomena. Sounds are a heavenly atmosphere control that I established long before the earth was. And I am going to see to it that in the earth will come sounds of heaven yes. that will not have to be announced by a pastor. You'll not have to tell a man that doesn't know me those sounds are heavenly because deep calleth to deep in the heart of every man, in the heart of every woman is an awareness of heavenly sounds. Yay. It Yay. was built in there before Yay. they were ever created. I put it in the core. Yay. It's below the DNA of what you call yay, yay, what yay. you call makes up man. I have declared from the beginning that my name will be praised. I have declared from yay. the beginning that I will be honored and that there is no other name given among heaven whereby men may be saved. And the sounds that Satan has used to so yes. control generations, yeah. to yeah. so control mankind, to so control the church. I am pulling the blinds off. Be it known that heavenly sounds are here and they are here to stay. They are not going away and they're not going to be just recorded. I have designed sounds for every moment of your life. I have designed songs. There are songs that are in the atmosphere that are waiting to be picked up yes. by my people. Yes. You have been plugged in to my spirit, says the Lord. Hey, hey. I said teaching yourself not I did not say just speaking to yourself. I said teaching yourself in psalms and hymns Yay. and spiritual songs. Ora masita. The church has all but lost the hymns Yay. because they've forgotten what is the core of the basis of your faith. I created songs to go with revelations that I caused to come to the earth. Because a song will last longer than a man. A song will propel that revelation and it'll paint pictures on the tables of your heart. There are songs and what makes a hymn is not time. It's a dimension of my power that goes on the hymns. It's a propellant of heaven 
into the earth, don't you see? Yay. There are hymns coming to the church now that'll propel your faith. You pastors have to have sounds around you that are anointed by me. Quit trying to be anointed on your own and let sounds of heaven infiltrate your sermon. Let it infiltrate the revelation. Didn't I say I opened up the dark sayings while David played the harp? You've got people in your church. If you turn them loose and let them begin to minister before me, I'll show you great and mighty things because the hearts of the people are stirring. I am stirring the hearts of the people. I have the ability to stir. If I can stir a king's heart, I can stir a peasant's heart. If I can stir a king's heart, I can stir a plumber's heart. I can stir any heart I so choose. But you can't have a form. You can't stay stuck in the formalities that have made you comfortable. This is not the day to be comfortable. This is the day to begin to push because there is a move of heaven. Yay, yay. Whenever there's a move of darkness, there's a much greater move of heaven. I will not be outdone. I will not be stopped. And my sounds will never be known as second class sounds. Sounds that don't measure up. Be it known that I am the creative force of all the universe. I have caused songs that can never be equaled to come to the earth because I have a great desire to see the things in earth be like the things in heaven. There are sounds that are coming now to the earth that were never before possible before the technologies of the day have begun to catch up so those sounds can be transmitted. There will be days of worship that will encompass the earth. There will be days when people will gather together in one nation and the other nation and the other nation and the sounds that will go will cause darkness to stand in attention and awe and dismay because they'll say we never knew it could be this way. There will never be congregations of darkness that will equal congregations of my glory. Hallelujah. If you're a pastor in this place, would you just lift up your hand? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I serve, as a servant of God, standing in the position of a heavenly sound, I unlock in your life and ministry from this minute forward the sounds of heaven. I call musicians and singers into your ministries supernaturally by the Spirit of God. I call sounds into your ministries. I cancel any injustice or wrong that you have seen or experienced where musicians come. You cannot hire, you cannot bring a hireling to do my business. That's truth. You cannot go looking around for someone who people think is good. You have to listen to my spirit and you have to be willing to do what I tell you. If I could teach a man to play who's never played, I can certainly bring the right one to you. You cannot put a harness on my sounds anymore. You wonder why your services are dry? Because you harness the sounds of heaven. Music was never intended to prepare people to receive the word. It does that automatically. It was intended to cause you that minister the word to operate in a higher level of my power, a higher level of my glory, a higher level of my dimensions. Because sounds are always connected to me. I am never absent of sounds. They're always around me, for I am sound itself. I am the sound that the world wants to hear. And I release myself in the middle of sound. And every instrument 
even those you don't know or recognize or not been introduced as of yet to the earth. Every instrument has a specific design anointing by me. And when that sound comes, there are deliverances that come on the wings of one sound that are totally different than another sound. Because I created sounds, musical instruments are my symphony. I have written parts for every sound to sound my glory, yes. to sound my yes. deliverance, to sound my victory, to stir on the inside of your spirit my glory and the dimension of my grace that the world has never even seen. It is not the time to try to follow what someone else does in another place. That's right. It is not the time to make your music sound like the world. You no. can take anything the world uses, but that is another distinct reason for music, and it's not really for the church meeting. It's for the evangelistic thrust to touch those in darkness held held by the sound. There are going to be sounds that come. It will not be a strange thing that there will be a service of worship and healing will just fall on the congregation. Ministrations of my anointing, healing. There will be deliverances that will just occur without a word having ever been spoken. This is the day to begin to see the demonstration of my power. But it cannot happen until the sound gets heavenly. It cannot just be by yourself. You were never called to minister just doing it all by yourself. I'm raising up sounds all around you. I'm raising up songs. There are songs that are coming, that are here now. Hear them, begin to write them, begin to sing them. Don't be stuck in just doing it like you've done it for years. Be willing to do a new thing. Be willing to launch out into the deep. Be willing to go where you've never gone before and see me do what you've never seen before. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for every pastor in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would cause a heavenly sound to blow in their spirit right now. In the name of Jesus, I give you the praise, Lord. Satan, you get your hands off Yay. of every sound in every church that is represented in this meeting. Yes, Lord. We thank in the you name of authority. Jesus Christ, every divisive spirit, Satan. every strifeful spirit, you get out you get in out. the name of Jesus. You have no place in God's sounds. Now, if you're a musician or a singer, I want you to lift up your hand. In the name of Jesus, whose servant I am, I call for the sounds of heaven to come into your ears now, now, now. I call for songs of righteousness to come now. I call for the spontaneous song of the Lord to be an addictive wildfire in your music. In the name of the Lord Jesus Thank Christ. you, Lord. And I give you the praise, Father. I thank Hallelujah. you, Lord. The Hallelujah. winds of heaven are blowing. Oh, God, let them blow on me. Yea, Lord. Let them blow on me.
See, this is a different dispensation than was in the time of Jesus. Turn her down just a little bit. And I want to say one other thing. Turn her down just a little bit in my mind. If you run sound in a church, I want you to lift up your hand. There are quite a few. Lift your hand and keep it up. Did You're not you called to be a judge of the service. You're called to be an instrument. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for every man, woman, who runs sound, that they would hear like you hear in the name of Jesus. That they would not just be a technical assistance, but they would be a spiritual benefit. You are instructed right now by the Holy Ghost if you don't pray during the service, get out of the sound department. Pray and believe God and put your faith because nothing dampens the Spirit of God quicker than a sound man who's a judge. You are an instrument that God uses just like He uses a piano or anything else. And the church has been notoriously asleep at the switch when it comes to sound. Satan, who is prince of the power of the air, does all he can do to stop sounds that are made in God's honor from sounding as good as they should. You have to understand that if you're going to preach, preach the gospel in a world-class sound environment. Don't be afraid to go out and do whatever it takes to make it sound right because you can't take heaven what we call sound systems on the earth, heaven laughs at. <laughs> because you not only hear the sound, you see the sound. Yeah. But we're in a time right now that God wants to do a new thing in the earth. And I want to say one other thing, Billy, and that's... Um, when hands, when you lay hands on someone, God does things by the law of contact. Yes. And what is, you must begin to teach, George, you must begin to teach that as the musician plays and her fingers touch the note that the God that is on the inside of her literally comes out of her hands as she touches the note and if you really saw the way a piano is, when you hit the string, there's a vibration that occurs. The vibration you call sound comes into the atmosphere, but God rides the sound. Sometimes you get the idea that God comes when the sound come. No, God's riding the sound. He rides the sound into the hearts of people, into the lives of people. He's riding the sound. He rides it just like you'd get on a horse and ride it. He's in the middle of that vibration. And Satan, who is prince of the power of the air, listen, he's prince of the power of the air. When, when the sound comes out that has God in it, it causes a disturbance in the atmosphere. Yes, it does. That's why religious people hate it when banners are waved for God because it disturbs the atmosphere. Religion doesn't like it when a clap is heard. Why? Because it sends a shock wave into darkness and it causes darkness to have to back away because what fellowship does light have with darkness? Darkness cannot stand in the presence of a sound that's full of God. See, a lot of times musicians, musicians lift up your hands. You're, you, you begin to look at your gift as a sideline issue. No, your gift is paramount to God. Because when you sound, demon forces have to back away. There's healing in your sound. If you are the redeemed of the Lord and Jesus is on the inside of you, then when you begin to play, when you begin to play, what gives life to that instrument is not the instrument. It's you. This doesn't have any life in it. 
Your body doesn't have any life in it except by the Spirit of God. And so when that sound comes out, healing comes out, deliverance comes out, I'm telling you, something happens when the sounds of the redeemed are heard and given a license to move. Because heaven, heaven right now is singing... And they're echoing our song. And we're echoing their song. It's true. Didn't Paul say there's no time nor distance in the spirit? Yes. So if you are, how many of you have the spirit of God in you? Oh, now, keep your hand up. Don't ever get, don't ever buy the lie that you don't have to make a sound just because you don't play a musical instrument you are a musical instrument you lift up your voice because as you lift up your voice heaven is heard from your voice Satan has to back away because the sound of heaven is in you say it's in me now it's in me now again it's in me now it's in me now and it comes out it changes my world it changes everything around me. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Recently, I was in the city for meetings for quite a while. And I came back to Prayer Mountain, where my nearest neighbor is a horse. And I sit on my deck and watch the birds and listen. I just said, Shelly, let's be really quiet and listen only to the sounds God made. And we listen, different bird songs, crickets. Did you ever hear that, that Dr. Carl Baugh did about the crickets when he slowed them down? And if you listen to that, it just sounds like a symphony orchestra. And I love that scripture which says that the birds, I love to watch the birds. He teaches me a lot with birds. And there's a scripture that says, in some translations, they are the voices in the branches that he set in the branches. And I was reading in the Hebrew the other day, and it says in that scripture, the birds are the sound that he put in the branches. So he put sounds, different sounds in the branches, little bird calls, hallelujah, glory to God. Brother Weissman, would you please come up to the platform? Bless the Lord. Phil, don't go too far away, because we're talking about things in people. Hallelujah, just have a seat over there, and I'll call for you in a minute. The Lord showed me that while the music was going and the sound and everything, when you reduce it to its smallest, minute part, it's, it's, it's uh, sound. Quarks. Little, little strings that vibrate and make sound. Isn't it amazing? Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. On June 29, we were out at Prayer Mountain, and we were having our Prayer Mountain. This all goes together because it has to do with what's in you being touched and brought out. And music is a way to do it. Hallelujah. But we were at Prayer Mountain, and we were praying, and we got all lifted up. The Prayer Mountain Prayers, if you're here tonight, you're a Prayer Mountain Prayer, stand up. One of the glory be to you. see that wonderful group? I'm telling you, and there are others who are around here working in other places. There are some back in there, yes. They can pray. And they've learned to pray together as a man and move as a man. And that day on June 29, Sunday, 3 o'clock, we have our prayer meeting every 3 o'clock every Sunday. They go to other churches and we all come together. And uh, 
the Lord lifted us up into a realm and spoke to us. And he said, we were praying for America, we were praying for Israel, we were praying for the world. And he said to us, there is one thing that will save America, and it is not the election. It is an awakening to God. And then he said, one thing will help Israel and the world, an awakening to God. And then he spoke to us about awakenings to God and how the United States of America was born out of the Great Awakening. Jonathan Edwards here, the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield from England, and they came over here. The Puritans had been here in the early days, but then people had to go on the frontier and build cabins and move west, and they got busy, and they, they didn't go to church anymore. And they had lost, they would had forgetfulness of God. And God sent these preachers and they preached with Holy Ghost fire and anointing George Whitfield. And by the end of the Great Awakening, they said four-fifths of the Christians had awakened to God. They might not agree doctrinally, but they had awakened to God. And something amazing happened. When this sense of unity came on them, it came on them for a nation. And they formed the United States of America. And I have read lectures from Harvard. I've been studying this. I have read lectures from Delaware and University. And they say the Great Awakening was born. I mean, the United States of America was born out of the sermons of the preachers of the Great Awakening. So if that's our foundation then what is our hope now? An awakening to God. Hallelujah. And he made us to know of the place of prayer in an awakening. And he said to us, the prayer meeting that you're going to come to in the fall is very important. And you must prepare yourselves and you must prepare the people who are coming for when they come to the meeting. And then the spirit kind of lifted, and we thought, well, how do you do that? How, how do you, when you can fast, you can pray, you can get ready, but how do you get all those people ready? And, and you've got a big place, rented. how do you even know they're going to come, you know? I mean, you know, the enemy's right there. To, and so we said, well, what will we do to get the people to prepare? So we decided, we devised a plan. We devised a plan. And our plan was that each one of us would pray in our own prayer closets. The next time we could all be together was two weeks away, July 13. And we were going to pray in our prayer closets every day. <laughs> and we're going to keep a prayer journal. If God tells us anything how to do it, we're going to write it down. And I was really hoping he'd tell some of them how to do it, you know. We even decided we would sing a song when we prayed. Have thine own way, Lord. Well, I devised that plan and I forgot to do it. It flew away from me like a bird. And when I was in my prayer closets, I wasn't singing Have Thine Own Way. I was praying about whatever the Holy Ghost. So July 13 is approaching. And I'd been out and about, you know, and July... 7th, I was home, and I had, that was the first day I'd been in in a while. And the phone rang very early in the morning, and it was Brother Norval Hayes' daughter, Zona. How many of you know Brother Norval? He's doing well, by the way. I think he's 88 now, and he told me he'd been in meetings, Holy Ghost meetings, that were the best he'd ever been in in his life, and told me some other good things, and really good. And I've been talking to him a lot lately because Zona, uh, since then, had an attack with her heart, but she got a brand new heart. God gave her a brand new heart. And even the medical tests show it. Show it. So we've been a lot on the phone lately. But this was July 7, and Zona hadn't had that attack yet. She called me very early in the morning, and she said, Billy, there's a man in our church that Daddy and I have a lot of confidence in. And in fact, if we uh, need to be out 
he oftentimes takes the church for us. She said, Billy, he never does this. He never, ever did it that I know of. But he has contacted me. Brother Norville said he even went to see him. And he says that he's had a vision that he's supposed to tell you. And he doesn't know you. And you don't know him. But I believe it would be a blessing to you and a blessing to Prayer Mountain if you would call him. So I did call him. And Mrs. Wiseman answered the phone. And I could just hear God in your voice when you did. It was a witness of the Spirit. That you knew God and your husband when I heard you. And you would never make up a story. You know, that it was, you were really going out of the way to tell me this. So, uh, Brother Wiseman told me that he had had a vision. And would you please, uh, Brother Wiseman, come up here and, and tell that vision? Welcome. I think it's on, yep. I'm glad to be here. We're glad to have you, yeah. brother. Sister Billy, I do want to say one thing. <clears throat> Both of these services earlier today were just masterpiece. I mean, that word, as Phil was talking a moment ago about the sound, there's been a sound of the heaven in every meeting mm -hmm. throughout today. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one thing that we overlook that took place at that baptism in the Jordan. Jesus was the complete word of God. The complete word of God. But for the first 30 years of his life, he never opened up one blind eye. Now I'm saying of his life, uh, meaning him in the flesh, he didn't stop one deaf ear, open up one blinded eye. But something took place at that baptism. Yes. The heavens rolled back. And that same spirit that your son was ministering in that afternoon service, came in the bodily shape of a dove and set upon him. I look at that as a type of the word and the spirit coming together. Mm -hmm. After that, we hear Jesus referring to himself as the I am. There was the word, there was the spirit, and then there was a voice. Yes. Why don't you lift your hands and say, God, make me a voice. God, make me a voice. Let me be a voice. Let me be a voice. But it was on April the 13th. I was in the Virginia, West Virginia mountains. I was there in a place praying and just alone with the Lord. And uh, God came to me that night. I was calling it a dream. I'm sure it's a vision. I told Sister Billy, I said, and I'm not proud of this. I'm a very skeptical person. And I guess God has to catch me while I'm asleep to give me a vision. Because I would probably say it was just my imagination and I imagined it. So, although I do believe there's nighttime visions. But after I had this dream, I woke up. The first thing I done was looked at the clock and it was 3.30 in the morning on April the 13th. But what I dreamed was I was in, after this morning service, I'm gonna call it an assembly. <laughs> that was a masterpiece. <laughs> but in an assembly, it, I could not call it a church service. It wasn't being conducted like the normal. Uh, but you could sense the presence of God in this building. It was a good crowd of people. Some were standing around the walls. And I heard a voice in that building. And this is all the voice said. There are ambers lying all over the ground on Prayer Mountain. 
I'd never met Sister Billy. I'd heard very little of her. I knew that every time Brother Norval and Zona had her scheduled, I would be away. My daughter had been in one of your meetings. In fact, I think it was here. And uh, when I heard this voice in this dream, I turned to look. I just turned. Well, when I turned to look, I had premeditated what I thought I was going to see. What I thought I was going to see was, for some reason, a group of people standing around a large bonfire. And, but when I turned to look, that was not what I saw. What I, I began to view was a, a wall. It was of just tremendous height and tremendous thickness. Now, I remember the boy spoke to me and said, there are ambers. Not embers, but ambers. Embers are coals of fire. Amber is mainly used in jewelry, other objects, but mainly jewelry. But then when I looked at that wall, it was the color of a glowing coal of fire. You could see heat emanating from it. And it were like people were embossed on that wall, the face of the wall. And I looked closer to examine, and as I looked closer, the wall was filled with people. They were just so deep in that wall. Well, the people were standing like soldiers. They looked like glowing steel. Just, they were a people that were fixed and but they were moving and the farther out from that wall they came the greater it became in thickness it was like the wall was growing as the people would move outward then the next place I found myself in this dream I was standing on a high place I don't know uh just a high place. And I looked and I saw the complete globe, just the completeness of it. And it was blanketed in such a thick, gross darkness. The complete globe. But around that globe, scattered, it was almost like one in one community, one in another, one in one town, or one in another, just scattered around the globe. And they were just illuminating, radiant, just such a bright illumination. The nearest in color that I could describe them would be like a white fluorescent. That was it. The next day, I called one of my daughters that lives in Sparta, Tennessee, about oh maybe a couple hours from where we live. And I told her, I said, Labrista, I had a dream last night. And I shared it with her. She said, Daddy, I had one at 1.30 this morning. She shared hers with me. Called another daughter that her and her husband live in Destin, Florida. I shared it with her. She said, Daddy, Tom and I were at an altar service last night, and both of us saw visions at the same time. The first daughter that I called, when I told her the vision, she said, Daddy, the name of Billy Brim's ministry is Prayer Mountain. I said, it is. She said, yes. Well, I kept pondering that. The part of the dream or vision Concerning what I had premeditated that I was going to see, the group of people standing around the fire, I was pushing that off because I was interpreting that as just man's plans, you know, my ideas. But the Lord spoke to me and he said, that holds a meaning. And I just simply said, well, what is it? He said, a season. I said, What's the season? 
said fall of the year. Autumn, fall. At that time, I knew for some reason, Sister Billy, I had to get in touch with you. Still not knowing about the prayer conference. I didn't know that uh, you had the place called Prayer Mountain. I knew none of that. I told Pastor Zona, I said, Zona, I really feel in my spirit I have got to share this with Sister Billy. Well, first she said, Brother Wiseman, I'll give you her number and you call her. Now, this is just my response because I don't do this. And I said, Pastor Zona, it don't work that way. <laughs> if any of you have ever been around Brother Norville, you have heard the word flaky, I'm sure. <laughs> the word flake and faith is used real often in his ministry. I said, Zona, it don't work that way. I said, you call her. I said, she's going to want to know a little bit about who's calling her. She said, Brother Wiseman, I'm sure Sister Billy will listen to you. I said, well, you call her. If you just want to share the complete dream with her, that's fine. Time went on. We'd come through our camp meeting there in Gatlinburg. Then she had to go to Hawaii. When she got back to Hawaii, she called me. She said, Brother Wiseman, I am calling Sister Billy today. Would you call her? And then it was the first day I was home in a long time. That was the first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She had known this for maybe almost maybe three or four weeks before, but she was busy as well. And then we began to exchange in conversation. Well, I was getting so stirred about, God, why did you tell me Amber? I mean, I could have perhaps understood more if, if he would have said there are embers as coals of fire on Prayer Mountain, but amber. I mean, I, I didn't know what amber, I didn't know that much about it. Well, I said, Lord, why did you tell me amber and not ember? He said, study. That was all he told me was to study. Well, I began to study, and I began to find out that amber, it, it's a fossilized tree resin. And as it, when that sticky substance, before it fossilizes, gnats may land on it, seed may fall on it, uh, butterflies, Feathers, they've found all these things in amber because they'll, they're preserved as that amber fossilized. But the thing that caught my attention more than anything was seed. How that seed can be preserved. And my wife had told me, she said, Gene, I heard on the news where here a while back they had found some seed in one of the Pharaoh's tombs that dated back 2,000 years. Here a while back, I had her to Google it to get an update on it. And this seed that they had found, it had been in, they'd found this seed in a tomb. And it had been there for 2,000 years. They planted it. And when she Googled it here a while back, she found out it is three to four feet tall now, and it's a date palm. I thought, if seed can last that long, look at the seed, the promise that God's given you, the word that God has given you, and time has tried to tell you that promise is not going to come to pass. But if that seed taken out of that tomb was planted and begin to grow and bring forth fruit, Guess what's going to happen to that seed that's in you? <laughs> well, I started saying, God, are you sure all this vision is for Sister Billy? Surely some of it's for me. <laughs> oh, just, I, I began to get so stirred. And as I began to see this tree resin, 
And it's referred to, as you study it, as the, a, a, a fluid, a substance that secretes or eludes from a tree. And it's referred to as tears or sweat. This tree resin that forms the amber. Well, I'm always listening for the voice of the Lord. I've just trained myself to do that. Well, I begin to think tree resin comes from trees. I have got an article here to where it's used in this article as tears or sweat. And I begin to think about a tree that stood in Gethsemane one night. The tree of life, Jesus. And Sister Billy, I prayed, prayed. And the word says, and it was as if his sweat became as great drops of blood. You know, the Lord has a preserved seed, a preserved people. Some of you, how many times has death come to you and tried to take you? Some of you, how many times has your funeral been planned? The doctor said, there's nothing I can do. But for some reason, God sent an angel to fill that grave in and you're still here. There's a remnant. There's a preserved seed. Oh, the Lord began to speak to me on this resin and this amber. I found out where resin was a part. Some people have used it in the making of frankincense and myrrh. Mm -hmm. Tree resin. Then that's connected to incense. Mm -hmm. And how many believes our prayers? David said, let my prayers come up before you as sweet incense. Mm -hmm. There is a people yes. that can bring forth a sound. Yes. Of the field, and their prayers can yes. be a prayer that can preserve things. I know that to this dream, this vision, through the Spirit, through the Word of God, this meeting has been foreordained, prearranged by the Lord Himself. Yes. As I was talking with Sister Billy, I said, Sister Billy, I believe this meeting, this fall meeting, is so chosen by God. I'm going to do everything in my power to be there. I just knew that it's God's time. When your son was ministering that word this morning, and my mind was just going and going. <laughs> and uh, I was praying on my way out here. I said, God, take us someplace where we've never been before. <laughs> take me somewhere in the spirit. Where the prophets of old did not. Yay. Maybe they prophesied about it. But they didn't go there. I said, God, take us someplace. Where man has never walked before us. And actually, that's what he was preaching this afternoon. There is a super natural move and that supernatural is an order of existence beyond the natural yes how many believe there's an order of existence beyond the natural it, God had an order of existence for that little widow lady yes down in Zarephath sure. an order of existence far beyond the natural Yay. In, in, the, in the natural, there is no math class, no algebra, no calculus. I don't care what degree you have. It doesn't matter what university you've been to. There is not one scholar, 
math instructor that can teach you how to take five loaves of bread <laughs> and two fishes and feed 5,000 men, not counting the women and babies. No math class that can teach you how to do that. That's an order of existence yeah. beyond the natural. I'm not concerned about the economy. I'm not the least bit concerned about it. Somebody asked me here a while back, they said, are you concerned about the gas price? I said, the same faith that I used when it was 49 cents a gallon will operate when it's 4.49 a gallon. <laughs> you see, I, I came up in a school where they used to sing a song, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. <laughs> give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, keep me burning till the break of day. I've just changed the song. <laughs> Give me oil in my Hyundai, keep it running. <laughs> God has an order of existence beyond the natural, and there's some people that's going to walk in it. There's some people that's going to move in it. There's some people that's going to experience it. Why don't you lift your hands and say, Woo! I am anointed. I'm anointed. There's only one Holy Ghost. Yes. Everybody hold up one finger. There's only one Holy Ghost. Well, I want to ask you, did Jesus have the Holy Ghost or did he not? Yes. <laughs> if there's only one Holy Ghost and I've got the Holy Ghost, how can you have the Holy Ghost if there's only one? <laughs> we must be connected some way, somehow. Whoa. The Word of God said, uh, you know, it pleased the Father that the fullness dwelt in Jesus. What did he give up when he was on the cross? When he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What did he give up? The what? Ghost. <laughs> Your son said something this morning about being normal. I thought, my Lord, how can I be normal when there's a ghost in here? <laughs> Forget being normal. You'll never have a normal church service when the ghost is let loose. <laughs> And he's a lot friendlier than Casper. <laughs> oh, go ahead and worship him. Woo! You can't be normal. <laughs> I remember Sister Billy the first time I went overseas and I went into Africa. I went through customs. That lady said, do you have anything to declare? I said, do I? <laughs> <laughs> I said, are you ready to write? <laughs> she said, that much? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, what is it? I said, I declare Jesus as Lord. I declare the, my name's written in the Lamb's book of life. I declare that I'm the head and not the tail. I declare the same spirit that brought Jesus out of the grave is dwelling inside of me. I declare that I'm the lender Woo! and not the borrower. Go. Uh, Hallelujah. She said, that's not what I meant. <laughs> I said, just what did you mean? <laughs> she said, well, what I mean, are you bringing any gifts into the country? <laughs> I said, am I? <laughs> I said, are you ready to write? <laughs> She rolled her eyes around two or three times and she said, go ahead. <laughs> I said, have you ever heard that the gift of God is eternal life? Have you ever heard of the gift of tongues, the gift of faith, the gift of miracles, the gift of prophets? She looked at me. She said, you need to be going through the VIP line. <laughs> Why don't 
you look at somebody and say, that's what's wrong. I've been in the wrong line. <laughs> oh, glory. Mm. Woo. glory. Oh, go ahead and give him a praise. Hallelujah. Glory. Praise the Lord. The Lord began to show me. I didn't want to share with Sister Billy everything I was seeing in this dream and in this vision. I didn't want to share everything with her. I wanted her to just take it and hear from God herself. But the Lord began to speak to me some things and concerning, you know, in uh, Jeremiah, where the Lord said, Jeremiah, I will make you a fenced brazen wall for Israel. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about her work in Israel. Then the Lord spoke and carried me over is in Zechariah where the Lord said, Jerusalem shall be inhabited like towns without walls, for I will be a wall of fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Around. Mm -hmm. At another time, we were in a conversation by phone. I was down in Florida. And I wanted to share that with her so bad, but I just thought, Lord, I just want her to get everything direct from you. I don't want to crowd her mind with the things I'm getting. But she said, Brother Wiseman, I just got back from Washington, D.C., Christians United for Jews. I thought, God, excuse me, I can't sit on it any longer. <laughs> Go. Hallelujah. Holy Ghost friends. You know, Sister Billy, if there's only one Holy Ghost, and he gave up the ghost there on the cross, there's something in us. Yes. Where was this Holy Ghost? That Holy Spirit that's in you. Where was that Holy Spirit when Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus? If there's only one, that Holy Spirit that's in us, where was that Holy Spirit that night when he went walking the sea? Mm -hmm. Somebody said, how do you know it's real? I said, there's someone in me that was there and witnessed it all. Amen. Glory. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, the oldest son received all the inheritance. When he died, it was divided amongst the brethren. Mm -hmm. That Holy Spirit that's in us was right there present. Right there present. The Lord began to speak to me. When I, I spoke with Sister Billy, she said, Brother Wiseman, the Lord has just been dealing with me concerning the word prepare. Mm -hmm. Prepare the people, prepare yourself. To tell the people to prepare, to prepare. Mm -hmm. Well, I was getting the word ordain, and she was getting the word prepare. Well, they both sound good. Didn't matter to me either one would work. But I was studying here a while back and I found out the word prepared is ordained. Mm -hmm. God had a land in the Old Testament. We read about it. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the Lord said, I'm sending my angel before you to the land that I have prepared for you means ordained. God's got an ordained place for everyone that's made your way to this meeting. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. I was back in that same mountain area. Now if you'll notice, the date that I had that dream was April the 13th. Our first phone call I had to, Brother Co uh, when we met back at the, remember we had said that God's going to tell us what to do on July 13, 
and we thought we were going to get it from our daily, our notes of our journal and prayer. Well, when I talked to him on July 7th, I said, Brother Wiseman, the prayer group will be together Sunday, July 13. Can you call, we'll call you and set up for you to speak to them by phone and tell them what you saw. And we believed that the fall meeting was the fall meeting and that God was telling us about it. So he spoke to, you see them over there with their orange buttons on? Because you spoke by phone. Stand up and point Donna to your orange button. Now that identifies her as being here that day so you'll know who they are. Bless the Lord. And uh, so Brother Wiseman gave us this um, vision. And it meant more to me. He apologized for not knowing me. I said, join the billions. <laughs> but I was so glad he didn't know me. And so glad he didn't know anything about me because he got some things about even our work in Israel. And about ordination. And uh, at that Sunday afternoon meeting, hold, hold the fort just here a minute. At that Sunday afternoon meeting, is John Simpers here? Uh, Lynn is. Stand up, Lynn. This is the better half anyway. And uh, Lynn and John moved here. Uh, Lynn was in uh, show business, and John's a writer, and they moved here from um, California. I would tell you, she, you don't want me to tell everything. Okay, I won't tell you everything. But she was one of Elvis's girlfriend in a movie. But anyway, we won't go <laughs> beyond that. And uh, she's a really good friend of Bill Cosby and sings great. Sing for us while you're here. Will you do that? Bless the Lord. But uh, John, her husband... We live in the boonies. Prayer Mountain's in the boonies. And when we moved out there, it took people 45 minutes to get, uh, if you had a fire, to get, you know, a fire truck to come. So John, her husband, had been in security and all kinds of things, and he said, we got to have a fire department. So Terry, stand up. He and my son, Terry, I'm telling you, they are the Cracker Jack firemen you've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, so John helps this little town in Omaha out a lot, little Omaha, Arkansas. Well, he knew that Brother Wiseman, we'd had the CD because they're real close with us in the ministry, though they don't, they work there, though they don't get paid. And uh, so, uh, John, we're right in the middle of this thing, and he runs in there. Did he have his fire clothes on? I can't remember. He runs in there in that meeting. He puts this in my hand, and he says, I got to get back to Omaha, but on my way over there to the, speak to the fireman. God said to give you this out of my collection. So what he gave me is an amber out of his collection. And in this amber, it has got, it's got a spider, and it's got gnats, and it has moss. And so we're sitting around there, you know. And we got this one guy sitting there, and he's got a couple degrees in physics and I don't know whatever else. And he starts telling us about ambers. And he starts telling us that they are the world's best preserve. They're one of the best preservers. Ice is a great preserver. But amber is a great preserver. And anything in this amber, uh, they can drill in there, and they can get out DNA of something that's very, very old. And in fact, um, uh, Jurassic Park. I didn't see Jurassic Park. Did any of you all see Jurassic Park? Well, I'm not much of a moviegoer, but I heard about it. And evidently, I mean, I've really heard about it lately. Something you don't know, and you don't know. Prayers don't even know it. And evidently, they took the theory that you could go down there and there, get this fly that had bitten uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex and then clone it in Jurassic Park. Did any of you see that? But see, they know and they worked on the, on the theory that ambers are great preservers. And um, I, not this weekend, this past weekend, I made a mistake and didn't write down one of my meetings and didn't tell Lynn. And so, um, planning for me just to be aside two weeks before this meeting, instead I had two meetings. 
<laughs> but anyway, praise the Lord. It was all good. And one of those meetings I agreed to, this past weekend I was in Huntington, Virginia. That was great. And the weekend before that, I was in Colorado. And I was invited to do a night to honor Israel that Victoria Hurst was heading up. And she'd invited all the little dancers and singers, you know, from Ariel. And she had um, Ron Nachman, the mayor. And um, so she said, Billy, I want you to speak. And so we arranged for me to speak and then hurry back home. And then she called and said, you need to stay an extra day. And the kids are going to be here, and I'm going to take them out to a farm and take them shopping. I want you to be with the kids. Oh, I don't have any extra days, but I did it anyway. And uh, so I got out there, and we had the meeting, and I spoke in the meeting. And I just mean I had an anointing. I, it was just great. I really enjoyed it. And I could tell that it was just powerful. And when I came down off the platform, Ron Nachman, the mayor of REL, he said, I've heard you many times. That was something. That was amazing. And there was this Jewish man there. And he grabbed me when I came down off that platform. And he said, I want you to go to my house and see my house. And he, uh, he was there dedicating a great big a banner like this. Real tall, 18 foot long. And it said, Jerusalem, written in Hebrew. And it had been presented to him by uh, the state of Israel. He had gone when Gulf War I started. And I know exactly when it started. Where are you, Hannah? Stand up. Hannah was born on the day Gulf War I started. <laughs> Hannah, they didn't have time to see how big you are, how, how old you are. But anyway, how old are you, Hannah? It was January 16, 1991. And he was over there to do the bat mitzvah for his daughter. And, and they started getting scuds on them from Saddam Hussein. This man is a graduate of MIT, a graduate of Harvard. He's a doctor, and his uh, expertise is the effects upon the human body of biological and chemical warfare, or just biological things and chemicals. And so since he was there in the land, and, 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 and Saddam Hussein could have put biological warheads or chemical warheads. He stayed in the land to help them know what to do in case he did. And so then they gave him this big banner in honor. And so he presented it to Victoria to hang in her place. And when I came down there, he said, I want you to come, I want you to, come to my house. He said, I, want you, he said, I have bought the, the Dallas Divide. Well, that's a mountain range. And he said, I have a house there, and it's right next to uh, Ralph Lauren's. In Telluride, near Telluride. And he said, it's completely self-sufficient. And I said, well, my son Terry, he loved to come there. He wants us to be all self-sufficient out at Prayer Mountain. Uh, but we don't have any winds, so I don't know how to do it. And he said, oh, you can do it. You don't need it. You can have, you got any sun at all out there? Yeah, we have sun. I can tell you how to do it, so this and that. So I said, oh, I'll send my son. So the next day, I went with the kids. But Alon Sharon was there. And Alon Sharon, he's here, isn't he? Alon Sharon has this... Uh, 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 Israel Marketplace back there. And he's a really good friend of all of us. And Alon Sharon, he's in on all this. Now, he's Jewish. He's not born again. He's Jewish, Jewish. But when he heard about this amber business, and the only place it's used in the Bible is concerning the glory and the fire of Ezekiel's chariots and the presence of God. And that word that's translated amber is chasmal. And it's an amazing word. So he's been doing all kinds of research on it for me. And it's when it's translated into the Greek, they trans translate it electron. And um, so he, he's been really excited about all this. So Elon Sharon went over to the man's house. And I got a telephone call from Alon Sharon. He said, you get over here. You go over here right now. You find a way. I don't care how much time you've got. If you even have to stay another day, you get to this man's house today. He was so bossy, that Alon Sharon. <laughs> and he brought a book to me. And in the book was the man's amber collection in pictures. Turns out he's one of the top experts in the world on ambers so I went over to his house fast as I could get there and up in the tippy tippy top of this beautiful home on the side of a mountain range 
There's like an attic up there, and there's where he has his telescope. When I was a little kid for Christmas, I always wanted those telescope kits, you know? And you got them, you barely could see anything. <laughs> Man, I looked at this telescope, whoa, you could see. And, huh? No, no, not, tel- not, tel- not microscope. Tel- not telescope, microscope. Shelly corrects me. She's my corrector who always sits on the front row and corrects me <laughs> when I give wrong scriptures out or something. Microscope. So he had this microscope, and he starts to show me some ambers. He said, you want to see one of the most rare ambers in the world? And he said, I'm, I'm good friends with the man that made Jurassic Park, and he wants this piece, but I'm not going to let him have it. And he said, you want to look at it? Does the sun rise in the east? <laughs> so I sat there with that microscope, and I looked. He'd had it made into a piece of jewelry for his wife. And it was supposedly 35 million years old, and inside it is a bee. B-E-E, perfect B. And so he said, I'm going to focus it right on its eye. So I looked in there and I saw that, you know, that compound, complex eye that bees have. Wow. Now to me, uh, I believe in the gap theory. If you want to know what that is, you buy my book. That's, uh, that however long science needs is between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. It's in my book, The Blood and the Glory. And what I think about dinosaurs, other people think other things, but it doesn't matter what you think about dinosaurs. You could go to heaven if you just believe God raised Jesus from the dead. (laughs) But personally, I think earth is as old as science requires, and I explain it in my book. So anyway, I know that I'm looking at an old bee, (laughs) and it's preserved in there perfectly. And I'll look in there, and I see every bitty thing about it. And he said, now I'll show you his legs. He turns it over. There's a little bent leg and little feathers, things on it. And then he shows me one with ants, millions of years old ants, caught in this sticky stuff and seeds. Hallelujah. And what? Then I said, oh, I said, you know what? I said, I'm really interested. You got a picture of an amber they're showing back there. Put that up on the up on the thing. Something's in it. See? Something's in it. And um, so I said, I'm really interested because of the old amber, the older age amber. Eighty percent of it came from the cedars of Lebanon. And I said, I'm really interested in that because the cedars of Lebanon, that's the wood that was used in the temple. He said, well, I know the expert on that. He lives in uh, Japan. He said, I'll email him for you. I didn't have to go through books and libraries. God's trying to get something over to us. Now, here's what he's trying to get over to us, I believe. We're his preservers. And inside us are things that come from way back even. And they came to us by the law of contact and transmission. How many times have you who are close with Brother Hagin heard him as he went down the healing line or he went down the ordination line? And the first two or three people, he'd say, I lay my hands on you in obedience to the law of contact and transmission. The contact of my hands will transmit to you the healing power of God. And he'd say it for about two or three people, and then he'd kick in, and then, you know, he didn't say any more. Here he went, and he'd just say, in the name, in the name, in the name, in the name. Something in him. Something that got released. Hallelujah. In our Bible, we see that one of the fundamental doctrines of Christ is the laying on of hands, Hebrews 6, 2. Let's turn to Numbers 27. I'm getting real excited. (laughs) 
Somebody mail me their grandmother's amber jewelry. See it here? And you can see a little stuff in there. And this was there, part of it too. Hmm, glory. Now, oh, I told you to turn to Numbers, and then I didn't do it. Turn to Numbers 27. Chip talked about this today. Everything's flowing right together. Everything's going right together. When Brother Phil was talking, I thought, oh, yes. Now look at this, Numbers 27, 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. And set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and give him a charge. That's what you do when you ordain people. Give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. Verse 22, and Moses did as the Lord commanded him and he laid his hands upon him. Now go to uh, Joshua, or Deuteronomy, go to Deuteronomy 34.9. Deuteronomy 34.9. Are you there? You're going home. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Say amen or something every now and then. Bless the Lord. Uh, this is uh, jo- Deuteronomy 34.9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom for... Moses had laid his hands upon him. Hallelujah. Turn to 1 Timothy 4, 15. Glory to God. Say something while you're turning their glory or something. 1 Timothy 4, 15. Woo! 4, 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now, 2 Timothy 1, 6. Hallelujah. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Chip talked this afternoon about Elijah and Elisha. You remember that Elijah was ready to go and and he kept telling Elisha to stay back and Elisha said, I'm not staying back. And he kept near him and then the anointing double portion came on him. And it was Elisha who was killed and who, excuse me, who died and was in a grave buried for a year and a soldier got killed in battle. They threw him in in that cave and he came alive from the anointing was on that dead prophet's bones. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Uh, You know, I knew to stay close to Brother Hagin for more reasons than one. And I didn't care if he told the story 9,000 times. Besides, I was the editor. I probably had heard it 59,000 times. And sometimes I think, didn't people know that he taught such and such? But maybe they didn't hear that one. But, but I heard it all because I took it and put it in books. And then I knew to stay close by him. And then the Lord told me to stay close by him. I'll tell you what Jesus told me about him. Brother Hagin didn't like me to tell it. But he agreed that it happened. I was preaching at prayer and healing one afternoon. He used to have prayer and healing every afternoon. And he was away, so I was preaching last day I fell down under the power right by the pulpit and, and Jesus came and stood beside me and he talked and I heard what he said and I saw what he talked about. Lester Sumrall uh, had done three books for him and he was trying to get me to come to work for him full time, putting the pressure on me. He said, what are you, he knew I'd quit Brother Hagin uh, and he said, we don't need any more preachers. We got plenty of preachers. What we need is good editors. We used to have Stanley Frodsham. We used to have so-and-so, so-and-so. You come to work for me and edit my books. But I did three books for him, and he was trying to get me to come and do another one. He 
He said, if you do a book for me, I'll take you to Israel. Ooh, that was a temptation. <laughs> but I saw a typewriter. This is a long time ago, vision, before computers, B.C. And I saw a typewriter plating, and I saw a paper roll out of that typewriter, and it went up in... The Lord said, that phase of your ministry is over. Now, he said, you will write books. You will write some of your own books. And he said, anything Kenneth Hagin ever asks you to do, you do. Because you will be connected with him forever. I went to Brother Hagin. I said, could that be right? He said, yes, that can be right. And he said... I brought you to the feet of the leading prophet in the land when you didn't even know there was such a thing as prophets. So I knew to stay close to him. And and you all know, you know, Keith Butler, that things came over on you. Deborah, Happy and Jeannie, you know that. Shelley, She's been close to him since she was nine. Lots of others of you. And then think about the people you've been around. And Brother Sumrall, he really believed in laying on of hands. And he told me that when somebody laid hands on, it could go through three people. Where he got that, I didn't know. And I went to Huntington, West Virginia, and Daryl Huffman, I was preaching at his church last Sunday... And he said, well, Billy, could it be here? Just above that verse where he talks about what's in you, he said, I want to call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now in you. He said, that could be where the three comes from. And Brother Wigglesworth, like Mama, I mean, uh, uh, Brother Sumrall, like Mama uh, over here, Mama was trained up by Wigglesworth. Put your hands on me. I got it. Glory! Something came into me. When Wigglesworth would come to America, he'd call for that little girl to be with him. And he took her everywhere he went in America. And Brother Sumrall, he had the good sense to go visit Wigglesworth. And something came into him. And he laid his hands on me. And God's got in us seed. In you. Meetings you were in. Brother Halverson. Oh. Well, we know it came into you. You act pray just like him. Think of all the anointed meetings you've been in. Think of Nani. And all that's in us in a place perfectly preserved. The world can't get it. The devil can't get it. He tried to lock it up. Don't you know? Throw it away the key. <laughs> Phil told me God brought him musical instruments in there. You couldn't see them, but Phil could. He played them because they're real. That realm is more real than what you see. That is eternity. 
the unseen will swallow up the seen. So down inside you. Just close your eyes and think of the people that you. Just close your eyes. Just think of them that had something in them. And you were around them. Hmm. Now what God showed us is. He's going to release his treasures. He knows how to treasure things. It says we have this glory in earthen vessels. That's not a put down. In the Middle East, one of the best things to save something in is an earthen vessel. That's why we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. They could breathe and, 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 and keep those scrolls for us. And it just knocked. I don't know how many of you study church history and all that crazy uh, doctrine that they had. What was it called? I've forgotten the name of it. Help me, Brother Allison. You know where they said that the Isaiah was written by five? Higher criticism. Higher criticism. See? <laughs> Higher criticism. They said Isaiah is written by five different authors. Well, and it's been written like recently, like in 400 years or so, whatever. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were 2,000 years old. It's all one. So it just knocked off the perch. Bless the Lord. But God has got inside of us precious seed. And when it is released, the amber, it becomes a sweet-smelling savor. And he's got gifts in you and in me and meetings that we've been in. And then he talked to him about embers. And he said that when we were in meetings and places where we were, where the fire was burning, we've got those embers... They're still glowing hot, and all they need is oxygen. And the Lord told him in the fall, I'm going to blow my Holy Ghost breath on those embers. And he's going to release what's in us. And he's going to ordain us to a different place we've ever been. We're still in the same army, the Lord told him. I'm talking about Brother Wiseman. We're still in the same army. But when you're in an army, sometimes you're in one post, and then you get orders to go to a new post. And the Lord said, in the fall, I'm going to give them new orders, the church, and I'm going to ordain them for their new orders. Is that right, Brother Wiseman? Where'd he go? I thought he'd done raptured. Is that right, Brother Wiseman? Glory. In this meeting, I'm telling you what I believe and what I know. In this meeting, if you came, that's what God told him. The people that come are going to go like Saul. Saul. When he went out from among those prophets, he was changed to another man. And I believe God did some of that work on us through this gift tonight. And I don't know exactly what's going to happen. We had a prayer meeting. I wasn't there. I was somewhere. I was at Daryl Hoffman's. But my daughter, Brenda, and my, and my Hannah was the first one that called me. She said, Mimi, prayer was something else. She said, and, and Brenda told me, and Donna told me, that at the prayer, it was like Jesus walked into the room. And they were all slain under the power. Though they were sitting up, Brenda said, it was like you're, you know, when you get slain under the power and you, you kind of know what's going on, but you're like there and in another place in a way. And what did the Lord Jesus say about that, Donna? He said that was a, that afternoon prayer that you had was a foretaste. Foretaste of this meeting. A foretaste of this meeting. And what happened there to you all that, that day is going to happen here. That's right. Hallelujah. That's right. And that's why when Phil was ministering, I 
one of you to say, I receive. Hallelujah. Mm. And the Lord said to him that the things that are in us go all the way back to the man Jesus. And it's been passed God's way by the laying on of hands, by association, and it's in us for now. Hallelujah. And we're together in a Holy Ghost workshop. And he's moving on us. How many of you, God, and he told us at the prayer meeting, the devil's going to try to stop him from coming. How many of you came because God told you to come? I know he told you to, Phil. Let me see your hands. Keep them up. Hmm. We're not going away disappointed. Hmm. How many of you have already tonight had something going on in you? You did. George, you did. Just uh, come up here and give us a psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song. What's in you? Take us somewhere in the spirit Where we've never been before <laughs> Take us somewhere in the spirit That we've never been before Take us somewhere in the spirit To a place we've never seen Take us somewhere in the spirit where we've never been before. Take us somewhere in the spirit that we've never been before. Take us somewhere in the spirit that we've never been before. Take us somewhere in the spirit To a place we've never seen Take us somewhere in the spirit Where we've never been before Take us higher in the spirit Where we've never been before Take us higher in the spirit Where we've never been before Take us higher in the spirit To a place we've never seen Take us higher in the spirit To a place we've not been before Take us deeper in the spirit where we've never been before Take us deeper in the spirit Where we've never been before 
Take us deeper in the spirit to a place we've never seen. Take us deeper in the spirit where we've never been before. Take us further in the spirit where we've never been before. Take us further in the spirit where we've never been before. Take us further in the spirit to a place we've never seen. Take us further in the spirit where we've never been before. Take us deeper in the spirit where we've never been before. Take us deeper in the spirit where we've never been before. Take us deeper in the spirit to a place we've never seen. Take us deeper in the spirit to a place we've never been. He'll take you deeper in the spirit where you've never been before. Take us deeper in the spirit where we've never been before. He will lead you in the spirit. He will open up the door to a place you've never been before. When you leave this place tonight, He'll turn your faith to sight. You will see yourself go up into that place. As you leave this room tonight, your spirit will take flight. It's a place before his face. And it's higher in the spirit than you've ever been before. Just follow the spirit. Go on through that open door. Take your mouth, make it do its duty. Speak and sing and pray. The Holy Ghost, he knows the The Holy Ghost, he knows the way. The Holy Ghost, he knows the way. Now, all of us, every one of us, when we leave here, we're going to leave in this. And you're going to go to your room. And don't turn on the TV. Don't check on Fox News. Mama Goodwin told me how to, to hold your place in the Spirit. When we had that first Secrets of Intercession meeting, I was drunk in the Spirit one night. You see it on those tapes. I put a bucket on my head <laughs> and preached with a bucket on my head. And God called some preachers living in sin and you'd have thought nobody would have come on that call. And three, and I said, there's three of them, and up they ran to the center. And God delivered them, and it was something. You remember that? So Mama Goodman, she knew. You have to know how to move and go and follow and flow. Yeah, he'll teach you. He'll teach you all things. And Mama Goodman said to my husband, he said, now you take her home, and we can really get something from God if she stays in this place. He said, you take her home. You put her to bed. If she's hungry, make her a little bowl of cereal. Just let her eat a little bowl of cereal. That's all. That's it. And you stay in the spirit. And I did it. 
And oh my God, we went someplace in that meeting. And it's still connected to now. And it wasn't anything in the physical. The Holy Ghost knows how. How to bring the glory. How to tell the story. How to shine. How to release what's in you and is mine, saith the Lord. How to blow upon those embers of fires that some thought were dead. But there's a fire glowing in you, bright red. And the wind of the Spirit will breathe on you. And the sound, they will hear it. <laughs> like in Acts chapter 2. <laughs> now you do tonight what you've just heard. And your spirit will take flight like an uncaged bird and you'll say this is what I've longed for all along I knew it was possible for this I have yearned and now by the spirit I've learned how I have learned hallelujah so let's just all go home tonight just like this you go back to your room I challenge you to let God move upon you. Just play something, Phil. It will go higher in the spirit. Nine o'clock in the morning. Lynn Hammond.